Hi, everyone. Good morning and welcome to Madison Square Park Conservancy's annual symposium on public art. We are honored and thrilled that so many artists, colleagues, neighbors, students, workers, supporters, and friends have joined us together in person today. Uh, my name is Brooke Kamen Rappaport. I'm the Deputy Director and Martin Friedman Chief Curator of the Conservancy. Um, our thanks to our partners at SVA Theater, Adam Natale, Rebecca Schwartz, Vidya Alexander Martinez, Vincent Burek, and Brian Sierra, who welcome us to this auditorium each year. They have asked that all of us wear masks when not on stage throughout the, throughout the program. Um, and thank you to our colleagues at Madison Square Park Conservancy, Dana Klein, Tasha Naula, Joel Nixon, Rosina Roa, Amelia Rogers, Andy Terzano, who are engaged here today. Um, and a big shout out to, out of great gratitude to Truth Mary Cole, our curatorial manager, who brings um, her great efforts and expertise to today's symposium. Unearthing public art is made possible by a generous grant from the Henry Luce Foundation. Thank you, Mariko Silver, President and CEO, and Terry Carbone, Program Director um, of American Art, for, Program Director for American Art. Early in the launch of conceiving an annual symposium, the Luce Foundation gave this program liftoff. Um, they endorsed the need for dialogue and scholarship in the public art field through breakout speakers around pressing subjects. So we are very grateful to them. As many organizations are working to understand the histories of their sites, the staff of Madison Square Park Conservancy met with Joe Baker and Hadrian Cummins of the Lenape Center here in New York to research and build a living land acknowledgement that acknowledged the park's 6.2 acres and the ongoing future. Please let me commence our program with an acknowledgement of the land. Madison Square Park is located on Lenape Hoking, the ancestral homeland of the Lenape Delaware people. We recognize that this land was forcibly taken, resulting in the displacement and genocide of the Lenape Delaware nations. Madison Square Park Conservancy respectfully acknowledges the Lenape Delaware peoples, past, present, and future, who continue to live, work, and connect to this land. The Conservancy honors the Lenape Delaware people, the original stewards of this land, through our commitment to a series of sustainability and restoration initiatives. In the coming years, we aim to reduce our carbon imprint, promote sustainable land management, and reintroduce species of fauna and flora indigenous to Lenape Hoking to the park. Thank you. It's now my pleasure um, to introduce Sarah Stein Sapir, a trustee of Madison Square Park Conservancy's board and a founder of our Art Council. Thank you, Brooke. Good morning. It is a great pleasure for me to see so many people here in person for Madison Square Park Conservancy's annual symposium. Since 2015, during this yearly gathering, we gather to investigate critical issues in the public art field. Our past symposia have reckoned with issues surrounding presenting and commissioning public art, accessibility by neighbors and communities, the dynamism that artists bring to the public realm, the role of historic monuments, and the impact of climate change through dialogue with artists and environmental leaders. This year, the Conservancy welcomes all of you to unearthing public art inspired by Christina Iglesias' project, Landscape and Memory, now on view in Madison Square Park. This morning, we will hear from artists, cultural leaders, journalists, and scholars about what lies just beneath the surface in their work and creativity. On behalf of my colleagues on the Conservancy's board, our art committee and art council, the staff who tend and steward the seven acres of the park, and on behalf of the artists whose work we have commissioned, I thank you for attending. And now I'll hand it back to Brooke. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks so much, Sarah. Um, today's symposium, Unearthing Public Art, gathers extraordinary participants 
who have all advanced writing, works of art, scholarship, or curatorial practice around unearthing concepts and materials, ideas and histories, artifacts and ephemera, at and just below the surface to inspire their work. I can't imagine beginning this morning without recognizing the context for this in-person gathering. We are living in and breathing in perilous times. The adaptability and need for civic sites in public parks, on museum campuses, in cities, and across the countryside has only heightened across the last two and a half years, confirming the role of open space as a necessity. Our institutions have been stimulated and startled on the essential role of preserving and protecting democracy, of understanding and responding to climate change, of defying violent acts of racism, and standing out against the anticipated repudiation of the 1973 Roe v. Wade decision. Our role as curators, artists, writers, supporters, neighbors, collectors, patrons, and our essential power as citizens is to uphold the continued conversation by artists, some of whom use the availability of public space um, for collective and private reckoning. How can we take these crushing times and put our practices to work? Threats to humanism and publicness are heightened. We have been seized by these times. Public art can carry inspiration and also take on dialogue on politics, culture, social space, um, because it's on full view, out in civic space, and not physically harbored by an institution. And artists who work outdoors often bring forth great work with nuance uh, from the deepest spaces that reflect the consciousness of what is humanity. This is what our speakers are going to consider this morning. So why dig deep? It brings hope for discovery and a way to shape a new future. Artists are excavating place for clues about native and lived pasts. They're studying obsolete maps to locate and respond to hidden sites and to survey natural history across time and terrain. They are recovering industrial detritus as evidence of progress and stagnation. Why are artists, curators, and cultural leaders pushing into the public realm with influential work that asks us as viewers to look intensely at what, at what is beneath the actual and metaphorical ground plane? And what are the implications of resurrecting buried natural and manufactured histories and bringing them to the fore of expectation and imagination? And is the role of public art um, in reaching large audiences key to how artists present new ideas on natural and cultural progress. These questions impact works of art that sit in civic space. Um, this morning's panelists include Alice Aycock, whose work since the 1970s has relied on voracious combinations of erudite and accessible sources. The unfolding events of our time seep into her sculpture as naturally as did the mythological and scientific studies that she's relied on as sources. Marin Hassinger's outdoor exhibition, Steel Bodies, uh, opened at, will open at Socrates Sculpture Park next week in Long Island City. Um, the artist's wide-ranging practice has, since the 1970s, examined intersections between ecology, humanity, and identity as they incorporate natural and industrial materials in her work. Kennedy Yanko works in paint, skin, and metal, repurposing industrial materials to make sculpture that she excavates from scrapyards and then transforms into work that are glorious in their intentionality and scale. And Ian Altavir, the Aaron I. Fleischmann Curator, Modern and Contemporary Art at the Metropolitan Museum, has organized commissions on the Met's roof uh, and most recently was part of the curatorial team that planned the Afrofuturist period room 
exhibition at the museum uh, derived from Central Park's Seneca Village, a 19th century community of black landowners and tenants that was seized in 1857 through eminent domain to make way for Central Park. Arts and culture journalist uh, and New York Times contributor Ted Luce will sit as panel moderator. Our keynote conversation is with Madrid-based artist Christina Iglesias and Lynn Cook, senior curator, special projects in modern art at the National Gallery. Uh, Christina's landscape and memory cites five bronze sculptures layered with bas-reliefs of invented rocks, roots, and branches just at and below the ground plane so that viewers can summon an ancient waterway that once flowed through the area, including present-day Madison Square Park. Following the keynote, there will be three presentations from um, artist Alan Michelson, a Mohawk member of the Six Nations of the Grand River, whose work uncovers suppressed histories and uses video, public art, sound, and augmented reality to foreground indigenous practice. Mark Wigley, professor and dean emeritus, graduate school plan of architecture, planning, and preservation at Columbia, will discuss Christina's work as it relates to the archival past uh, and building constructs. And the morning will conclude with Deborah Landau, poet and professor and director of the creative writing program at New York University, reading from her work that considers human experience of personal excavation. We are grateful to these visionary people for being here today, and it's my great honor to start off with the opening panel discussion um, to welcome moderator Ted Luce and panelists Ian Altavir, Alice Aycock, Marin Hassinger, and Kennedy Yanko. Thank you. Great to see everybody today. I think we are starting with Ian. Everyone's going to do a few slides before we begin. Thanks. Thank you, Ted. It's such an honor to be here, especially with so many extraordinary artists whose works I esteem. Um, and I thought I would begin very briefly um, with a story about the Mets Roof Garden, um, a site that about 10 years ago, um, the curatorial team under Sheena Wagstaff began to reconsider as a space that could respond even more trenchantly to its site, to the 5,000 plus years of art history that lie in the building just underneath it, and to the park that surrounds it. Um, a space fraught, of course, with a history of its own. Um, and I was privileged to curate the first three of our newly launched roof garden commissions in 2013 with the Pakistani artist Imran Qureshi trained in Lahore, Pakistan, in the traditions of Mughal miniature painting. And Imran, as you see here, changed the site um, into a flowering field in the color of blood, thinking both of Mughal uh, walled gardens and the way in which the park itself is a kind of walled garden surrounded by the limestone facades um, of Fifth Avenue and Central Park West. Um, the following year, I had the great privilege of working with Dan Graham, known um, as he was for creating garden pavilions that think about um, the space of the park um, as one of confrontation, one of play, um, and one that carries with it a history of landscape design. Um, but of course, it's Pierre Wieg's commission in 2015 um, where my first conversation with the artist entailed a question, one, about what the Central Park Conservancy did with the corpses of animals they might find in the park, and two, <laughs> whether we might take a look at the history of that site. And I'm showing you here an extraordinary photograph um, of, one, the, the Natural History Museum going up in the late 1860s, and the park itself, just beyond it, wow. being excavated, being torn apart in a way, um, to make way for what is essentially a new landscape that reads, though, as an older one. Um, and in particular, Pierre was interested in a site 
several blocks south of the current Natural History Museum. You'll see in the top left corner there a, the little outline of a structure near the corner of 63rd Street and Central Park West, which was to be um, a proposed Paleozoic Museum to be constructed in Central Park based on the reconstructions of dinosaur um, bodies by a famed early British um, paleontologist. Unfortunately for this paleontologist, he ran afoul of Boss Tweed, the uh, man who held New York in sway in the 1860s and early 70s. And apparently, anecdotally perhaps, because it was never reported in the press, Tweed's goonies broke into the paleontologist's studio sometime in the middle of the night in 1870 and tore asunder his models of dinosaurs in progress, carting their broken bodies away and dumping them somewhere, perhaps in Yonkers, or perhaps at the bottom of what was to become <laughs> Central Park's lake. Pierre was fascinated by this story and thinking about what lay under the surface of the park, what kind of ancient strata might be under there. Of course, a museum of paleontology being a symbol, in a way, of so much of what um, those 19th century institutions, of which, of course, I'm employed, by which, of course, I'm employed, but one, the, 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 the impulse to catalog, to make taxonomies, to try and come up with some order in our natural world, um, became a mode of inquiry for the artist. And you see here um, a, st a particular stone, a New York schist, that we sourced, um, something not unlike the kind of rock that forms Manhattan bedrock. And somehow, we managed to convince the museum to let Pierre excavate the very roof itself, not to mention, of course, all of those um, millions of objects below, many of whom are susceptible to things like water leaking through. And Pierre also added an aquarium which housed two species of floating stone, of volcanic rock, and two species of um, ancient sea life, aquatic life. Here, a, a particular kind of shrimp. You see um, a fossil. This is, this is a species that has been around for millions of years. And a particular kind of lamprey eel that lives in the streams um, in the area. They inhabited this aquarium. Um, and the landscape from within those stones began to grow and bloom and change over the course of the season, creating a kind of spectral garden that flourished on the roof and made one think of things that might be just below the surface in the park outside of our precincts. I began to think about the park again very much in 2019 when the director of the Met asked me and a colleague, Sarah E. Lawrence, the Iris and Gerald B. Cantor um, curator in charge of European Sculpture and Decorative Arts, to think about making a period room of the present. Um, when given this brief, I questioned it in, 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 right away. Um, I thought period rooms were always about the past. And indeed, we were able, I think, in the end result, to come up with something that interrogates not only the past, but also our present, and also perhaps the future. And working with the extremely talented and thoughtful Oscar-winning production designer, Hannah Beekler, and the extraordinary um, associate director and curator from the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture at New York Public Library, Michelle Commander, the four of us built um, with Hannah's design a house that approximates something that might be, that might yet be, that might still be, um, owned by the descendants of the Seneca villagers who settled a site in Central Park in the early um, 1820s. Um, it was, and I'm showing you here a slide of what that site is like today. The Central Park Conservancy has done extraordinary work in erecting nine temporary um, plaques throughout the, throughout the site, which stretches from about 81st Street to 89th Street um, near Central Park West to, tell, to begin to tell the story of this extraordinary community of some 40, 50 houses, three churches, 
cemeteries and many gardens that flourished from the 1820s until, as, as Brooke mentioned, 1856 and 57, when it began to be destroyed to make way for a site for a very different kind of public. Um, that site, which you see here in the two extant um, archival sources that we know of, that document this space. One of them, the hand-drawn map from 1856 by, by Vaux, it was began to be a way, a topographical map, right? And on the bottom right, you see a, a portion of the map that spelled out this site's destruction, right? This includes the names of all of the landowners in Seneca Village and how much, how very little, actually, they were paid for their land. Um, but this is how we know, and this is how some extraordinary urban archaeologists who fought for years to excavate that site, to document what we didn't quite know yet, but what they were certain of, was an, in, it was an extremely rich territory. Um, and they were able to undertake this in 2011, finding an extraordinary cache of hundreds of ceramic pot shards and other remnants of this flourishing settlement. Um, using those fragments, we decided to make um, the 19th century examples of what the villagers might have in their house whole again by borrowing parallel works from our colleagues in the American Wing, for example, an amazing um, pot on the left by Thomas Kamara, for example. There were gray salt glaze ceramic shards found on the site of Seneca Village, but here we have a whole extant version by this incredible free black potter who had a kiln at Corlear's Hook on the Lower East Side of Manhattan in the early years of the 19th century. Or on the right, an extraordinary vulcanized rubber comb whose broken chain motif speaks, I think, volumes to the possibilities of emancipation and, pos and, um, and other opportunities that Seneca Village offered to its inhabitants. And here I just end with a picture of Hannah Beekler's shot for the, for the New Yorker magazine where she poses against an extraordinary wallpaper commissioned by us, by the LA-based artist Angedeka Akunili Crosby, which documents, I think, how very much, how very rich that terrain was and, and the possibilities it symbolized for its inhabitants before um, they were so unceremoniously removed from the site. And I think most importantly of all, um, the site of Seneca Village um, echoes so many others over centuries in this country, so many other sites of opportunity, possibility, and flourishing for black Americans that have been erased um, over the decades. F everything from Black Bottom in Paradise Valley in Detroit, to Treme in New Orleans, to Greenwood in Tulsa, Oklahoma in 1921. There are countless sites around this country um, to which we must return and to which we must begin a conversation about the potential for reparation. Okay, so I am going to scroll through uh, as quickly as possible about 50 years of work, uh, a little bit like Instagram. And um, uh, so I began in the early 70s when earth art, site art, land art was uh, in vogue. And I made these uh, very temporary works um, in what I refer to as the necessary structure in the contingent event. The structure was a fan, the wind fans on the sand generating waves or moist, wet clay cracking. And it was very anti-object and all about process and transitory work that mimicked processes in nature. And then I moved very quickly, almost as a turncoat, to making structures, architectural structures, which I called non-functional sculpture architecture, um, in which the structure was what I built and the event was people moving through. 
And I was very still concerned about the earth and uh, archaeology, and in one case, the simple network of underground tunnels and wells going from light to dark and discovery and putting yourself in a kind of not really dangerous but slightly precarious position. I kept using the notion of the labyrinth or as the ma or the maze is the kind of structure which uh, which organized these architectural semi-architectural pieces and they also tried to reference the context art park and industrial spoils pile and in this case, 100 small rooms in Houston, Texas, which is the house on the hill, the house with the picket fence. But under, inside, it was a, a maze, a labyrinth. It took about 45 minutes to get through it. Um, at some point, I began to get interested in industrial architecture, the urban uh, setting, because I was also a student of Robert Smithson, and I really liked the way he took on nature, but also he said, we've got to deal with, we can't just escape into this kind of so-called paradise. We have to deal with what exists. And so I also really, again, picking up on the notion of wind, which has been throughout my work, this sense of, of turbulence, I began to make these big machines which were like turbines or vortexes. I'm still, um, they weren't that popular, I might say. Uh, however, I still feel a great sense of affection for those pieces. And then I also began to work with architects in, in public settings, in real architecture. And again, the notion of the vortex form or stairs or flying saucers kept going. Now, when I began to work really in the urban environment, I tried to justify. I went back and I said, how can I build these things in the world? What, what is their relationship to the world? And not just a sculpture that sits there that people have to learn to understand, but what if I create something that talks to the world and that you see something around it, whether it's the road or the bridges or the stadium, and you go, wow, I hadn't looked at that as art. Then you look at my piece, and then you go back to the world itself. And there is this kind of dialogue with the context, and in some cases, the urban context and airports, and I was still wanting to deal with movement. So in one piece, it's called a star sifter, and I got interested in using not just earth or aluminum or a steel, but also using light and LEDs and wherever I could, movement, and speaking to, even though it's stop action and static, the movement that's all around us and the constant change. I also love flying saucers and the notion of aliens. Oh, if they would only come to save <laughs> us. So it's sort of like speaking to those. Uh, finally, a piece that's been very maligned for some reason down there in uh, Miami, and it's sort of like uh, the, the, the plant that takes over, that rises up and becomes a sort of insect and invades the world. Um, so these are some of my sources quickly, and I have to say that Leonardo's Delu Deluge series inspired me over and over, and his sense of curiosity. It's like, there's that thing out there. I want to figure out what that's about. I don't want to be confined by a certain set of rules that I can't, that art can't go wherever I need it to go. And his sort of um, walking between science and, um, and art. Leonardo was always uh, sort of on that tightrope. And so at some point, this w thinking about wind and turbulence and whirlpools and rotating structures and spinning tops became what I call the Turbulence Series, which got set up on Park Avenue in 2014. Um, I think something like, I forget, six, seven sculptures. And what I thought of is, all the wind that blows up and down, both the theoretical wind, the hot air, and actually the wind. And it was called paper chase. And I was thinking about paper that's blowing up and down and wind that, so each one was different, 
based on really looking at weather patterns and hurricanes and tornadoes and also speaking very much as much as I could. And, it, and a piece in nature is one thing, and this speaks to this beautiful park outside of London, Chatsworth, and it's another when it's in the middle of all that traffic, speaking to another context. So, um, so these pieces now have begun to uh, be generated in other contexts. In this case, it's a hotel complex, to, um, a waterfront, which you can't see here in Toronto, another sort of piece that in a sense is as though things have been blown into it. And finally, I'm going to read a poem. I've been told my time is up. And so I'd like to read one final poem um, by a very favorite author of mine, whose name is W.S. Merwin. It's called Utterance. And he worked in Hawaii. And he says, sitting over words very late, I have heard a kind of whispered sighing, not far, like a night wind in pines or like the sea in the dark, the echo of everything that has ever been spoken still spinning its one syllable between the earth and silence. Thank you. So when um, I was very small, I think just five years old, um, we lived in Los Angeles. My father was an architect. And he built a sandbox in the backyard for me and filled it with his sand. And there was a hose nearby. And I began to make rivers in this sandbox. And he had been a student at USC, and I think as part of his work there, he had made a series of boats. They're wonderful boats. And they were of some kind of metal that wasn't so heavy that it would sink. So I started using these boats and playing in this sandbox and making these rivers. And it was the most utterly transportive and enjoyable thing that I can ever remember happening to me. It was Los Angeles in the 50s, sunshine, very little smog, grassy backyard, and I could spend hours doing this. And, and I did. And I'm reflecting on it now because I realize in those, uh, you know, quiet moments with no threat around, no future in the distance, nothing. I played and played and played with that sand and water and those boats. And it gave me the most utter sense of joy and peace. And then time went on, I was involved with all kinds of things, went to all kinds of schools, had a lot of opportunities, got good grades, did pretty good in art, you know, but still wanted to be a dancer, studied with some Horton Technique people and, uh, you know, did that, got to Bennington College, which was very, very fancy for the time. Um, there were just very, very few black students there, probably count them on one hand, and all girls extraordinary um, tuition, extraordinary. And um, wanted to be a dance major. And they just told me flat out, no, you're better in sculpture. So um, my sculpture teacher, Isaac Whitkin, he welcomed me. And I thought, oh, God, I really you know, I really want to dance, you know. 
but he, you know, would guarantee I got a degree and got out of there, and he was a very nice man, and his work was very good. So I said, okay. <laughs> so I did that, and I got out of that situation, and um, went to New York, was there for a while, decided to get a graduate degree, moved back to Los Angeles, um, applied to graduate sculpture, because by this time, you know, I'd gone to Bennington College, you know, this internationally known teacher, you know. Um, no, I couldn't get into graduate sculpture at UCLA. It would not accept me. But fortunate for me, there was a man who um, was developing a new fiber structure class. And he um, said, well, you know, you could join us. And I thought, well, why not? I get an MFA, I can teach afterwards, okay, I'll do it. I didn't know, you know, I, cause I never sewed anything. I didn't even, I don't know, I didn't know anything about this. Um, but he really supported the, th the uh, making of sculpture and I found a new material in rope, and I, you know, I made these things. And when it was all over and done with, I had found wire rope, which is steel cable, and I was making sculptures that were freestanding, that could be welded or not, bound or not, um, but they were, totally new, um, and um, I found in the wire rope a profound resistance. It refused to do anything I wanted it to do. And so we had this terrific conversation for years and years and continue to do so. And I'm, I guess I'm telling you this long story is because I'm really trying to tell you that it's very difficult to be anything, you know, truly difficult. And if you decide on something that's uh, pe really peculiar, um, that doesn't really have an income, it's doubly hard and, or triply, and, um, But I was fortunate because that ho I had that whole background of being in the sandbox, and it absolutely became the sandbox, the wire rope, and me. And um, that's the way it is. And although <laughs> it's a limited series of relationships, um, yeah, that's the way it is. So now I'm going to uh, show you some slides, um, and um, oh, pink is a color that I've used a lot because it's, it complements green, and a lot, of, a, a lot of what happens to me seems to happen you know, outdoors around green things. So I push this one, <laughs> the green one. Okay. So in the same show, Alice, yes. <laughs> you were right, <laughs> right over there. <laughs> yeah. And then all of this was there. Yeah. Um, and you know, how many people, and I do want to see your hands, were born on this date of 1980. <laughs> well, hallelujah, there's two of you, three of you. <laughs> okay, so it's been a long haul. <laughs> uh <-huh>. Yes. <laughs> okay, then we jump quite a bit to um, a show I was in uh, in 2018. Uh, where I made site-specific sculptures in Marcus Garvey Park in Harlem, which is the neighborhood I live in now. And um, this is in honor of the people who play chess there. 
and, and they're very avid chess players. And they just couldn't understand what I was doing. And why are you putting that there? What are you doing? You know. And then at the end of it, they were like, don't take it down. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, a piece at the Smithsonian in DC. Um, Just simple armature and branches, and a lot of uh, friends and some family there to help me put it together one afternoon. And um, the woman on the right standing up with a brown cap, uh, that's my daughter, Ava Hassinger, and she has also become an artist. And she lives in Philadelphia, and she teaches at um, she teaches art at an all-black college uh, called Lincoln. So with all of this difficulty with making art, I also managed to have two children. <laughs> Weren't easy either. <laughs> I did serious performances. That's as close as I was ever get got to uh, being a dancer. Um, and this is called women's work, and we are, you know, kind of mindlessly twisting these strips of newspaper and making them into things. A current show at a Susan Inglet Gallery here in the city. Susan Inglet is the first opportunity I had to have a gallerist. And um, I think I started working with her in 2020. So it took years, years. And in these are vessels that I became involved with because I thought vessels and people are very alike. And I used the wire rope, and I used fabric, and I made drawings. And finally, this you'll see at Socrates Park, be up for quite some time. There are um, about 10 of these. And I made these in collaboration with some fabulous fabricators there. And what this expresses to me is that we are all related. And we are all related to the land and to one another, coast to coast, nation to nation, religion to religion, thought to thought. Thank you. I'd like to begin my three-minute PowerPoint and just acknowledge what an honor it is to sit here with you, Alice and Marin, today. Um, also, Ian and Ted as well, but you guys don't know me. <laughs> really, it's such a pleasure. Um, so my name is Kennedy Anko. I'm a multidisciplinary artist working in sculpture and installation. Um, typically, I'm working with paint skins, which are poured paint that then dries and I use as a sculptural material and incorporate it with found metal or different natural elements like glass and marble and wood, but mainly metal. And um, my approach to public art is very personal and has to date been mostly within the walls of institutions. I think my art has recently been considered public art because it's grown in scale and is so big, which is actually an interesting conversation in and of itself, but the title of this symposium is dead on for me, as my process is really about unearthing and pulling or pulling through the unseen. The somewhat invisible things like assumptions, preconceived notions, and our conditioning. I use socio-political subjects to explore these concepts in my work. <clears throat> the obvious way my practice relates to unearthing is in the excavation. I'm salvaging metal from yards and then manipulating its composition. For my exhibition, White Passing, at the Rubel Museum, pictured here, I took a discarded shipping container and made three hurricane-esque pieces out of it. I had an impulse, a feeling of what I wanted to make with that metal, 
but the work defined itself and showed itself to me as I made it. For the past few months, I've been working in Amsterdam on the sculpture for the unlimited curated section of Art Basel, Switzerland. The greatest challenge I've faced has been working intuitively within a realm that requires plans, blueprints, heavy machinery, and a team. <clears throat> as an artist, as a painter, I'm having to learn what it means to be in a leadership role. <clears throat> and once you come off the canvas, you immediately have to interact with other people and contribute to studio culture. And I've had to put my ego aside <laughs> and um, trust in a new way. So I'm reflecting on this and being transparent and straightforward about what I'm learning in the public sphere. Um, I've been observing and aligning with the waves of obstacle, the waves of challenge and decisions that accompany moving into large-scale sculpture. It's one wave after another, a question, a decision, a question, a decision, it, to create this work. And I've had to take things one step at a time in order to receive and respond to what's happening in front of me without coming undone. I've had to unearth within me an aspect of self that can guide, direct, and produce, and lead. So this is my core team in Amsterdam, Jewel, who's been my right hand for nearly five years now, and Wes and Rumor. In talking about unearthing public art, I guess I'm most interested in talking about the internal excavation that has, that has to happen for me to be clear, for me to make decisions at this scale. I've always had to ready myself physically to be open to the sensation of color and form, but intellectually organizing myself to lead has been something different and something necessary. The studio culture has shown up as a critical, really important piece of this puzzle. I've, I've always tried to cultivate a particular environment for myself, but creating with others is special and leads to moments like these. I wouldn't be able to build this on my own, and I wouldn't want to. I get to imagine alongside others an accomplished, succeed, experience with these people and things that become extensions of self. We all emerge at some, we all merge at some point and yet stay distinct in our own roles and that feels good. Um, so on that note, I'm just really excited to be here with all of you today and to explore this a little bit more. So thank Thanks, you. Sir. Those presentations suggest so many topics and questions. Um, I think one thing that is fascinating is the idea of public art requires the public, the actual people who are reacting to it. It's a little different. The Met Roof is one thing. You've paid your money, and you're at the Met. You're there to see art. But some projects that are public art, you come upon them in the park, as in Madison Square Park. And Marin, you talked about the chess players reacting to, you know, they were like, no, 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 and then they actually like, don't take it away. How much do you have to take in account what the public actually thinks in, when you're doing a public piece? Maybe we'll start with Marin and Alice having done so many projects like that. Do, do we care what they think? Do, is, the, <laughs> is the feedback loop something that you take into account? Um, I take it into account, but um, I had the luxury of in, in initially building things publicly, but really privately. And uh, so the, uh, they existed as photographs that I brought back. Uh, and a lot of the work still exists really that way. Um, I guess I feel, I always, when I'm teaching, I take the fly leaf, I hate to be so whatever, from Portrait of the Artist, Ulysses, where he starts with himself in class, in a situation. He goes then to the, the, the school, the city, the world, the universe, and he goes back. And I try to start that way. I have to, and I, and I whether, I have to hold on to my experience and my knowledge first, and then take it into the world and have that discourse and that experimentation and the feedback. But I think it's very important also for an artist ultimately to, uh, to try to, after interrogating themselves relentlessly, I would say, to then find that core center and to be able to believe in that when you put it out there. And my way of dealing with it, it is 20 years from now, am I going to go, I don't want to look at that? Yeah. <laughs> did I, did, you know, uh, even though I, uh, or can I still feel that, you know, that I, that it was worth doing? And, and, you know, and to take 
what they say, the cliche, if you can't stand the heat, get out of the kitchen. <laughs> but if you collapse every time, right. you, you'll never get anywhere. So I don't know if that answers your yeah. question. <laughs> Maren, what's your take on that and, and people's reactions to your work? I had the relationship with whoever the curatorial people were at the Studio Museum. And I told them what I would do, and they accepted that proposal. And then we started collecting all these branches, which was endless. I mean, it was ridiculous. So my issue with, for example, that show and those pieces was making those pieces. <laughs> You know, just getting enough branches, enough help, you know. And one of them, a circular one, a homeless man lived in. I mean, he hopped over the top and lived inside. That's feedback of a kind. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and they were just branches. People could have knocked those things over, thrown them down, but somehow they tolerated them. Yeah. They didn't do anything to them. Yeah. 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 And even after a while, because it was a long show, you know, um, even after a while, I, I felt like somehow intuitively the chess players began to understand that they were my inspiration. So it was about them. It's not always an immediate, yeah. Awakening. And nobody told them, you know, I wasn't telling yeah. them anything, right. but um, in answer to your question, it's maybe not exactly like Alice's pieces because I knew they were going to come down and I knew they were branches yeah. so they could go back to the earth, you know, so yeah. maybe it's, it's not, maybe that's a hard question to ask because it doesn't really apply to everything. Yeah. Well, in the pandemic, that's another thing I wanted to ask about is we've been, some of us have been hiding, everyone's masked except for us. We've been, gathering has been so challenging and maybe start with you, Kennedy, but just in terms of how, how necessary is public art in particular right now? It actually is, outdoor art is one of the only places we can gather without masks in some cases. You know, how, what, does the pandemic change the importance and vitality of that? I mean, I don't think so. I mean, I think it was always really important. And I think it's always really important for people to have access to art wherever they are. And I think typically, especially when we're putting public art in different environments where people don't intentionally go to museums or go to art shows, and like we're kind of infamous for having a, a very elitist culture that yeah. make people uncomfortable. So to make an opportunity where it's like, we're just going to put it in front of you, and hopefully it, it offers you something, is, is it's always just been in entirely necessary yeah. um, for inspiration and, and for opportunity for expansion. I, I wonder if Ian, you feel that the roof project is a place where people are also like so happy to take off their masks. Yeah, when well, they get their roof. it is one of the few sites still um, at the museum where we're allowing folks to take their mask off. Um, but I think I'm so interested in in all three practices here which in some, to some extent, of course, deal with unearthing. And, the, and I love, Marin, your story about the sandbox as a site of experimentation. I mean, it's the, it's the ultimate metaphor for, for creative space that you also excavate mm -hmm. and change the landscape of. And I think all three of you um, do this in extraordinary ways to think about natural elements, the passage of time, the way that materials erode and change. And, and I think that um, really excellent public work um, speaks to those histories and experiences, right? Um, and there's something about seeing that amazing slide of art on the beach, which is, of course, it was a big sandbox, right? I mean, I was, <laughs> yeah, right. I, was, um, I was not old enough to see that show. I was born already. <laughs> um, but um, but I, I've, I've explored that, that exhibition's history many times over the years and every time get something new from it and to think of it as a sandbox as well, which it really was, right? This is, a, yeah. <laughs> this is the earth that was removed from the site of the World Trade Center, right? And, and began to become a landfill 
which is now Battery Park City. And the idea that it's a space, a kind of nascent space, a, a weird in-between space um, in a city that was changing at the time, new land that was old land, at the, and, and um, such a fraught space and such an interesting site for possibilities. Mm -hmm. And I think that show is so extraordinary because it speaks to all of those layers. I mean, all of the artists that participated in it responded in such interesting ways to that, that liminal zone that, that that beach was, right? It was also a place where people just went to hang out on occasion, you know? Yeah. Maren, I wanted to bring up the issue of scale and to start with you, because I think it's one thing we see with public art is with the Christina's project is that it's a, we're, we're spending so much time looking up in New York City, there are tall buildings, but Christina's project suggests that you look down. And Maren, you have a piece of MoMA right now leaning, which is very low to the ground. And public art does not have to be big to be impactful. Scale is something that artists, play, and you know, of course you and all artists play with scale, but how, how can it be, things can be impactful without being big. Can you speak to scale? Um, well, leaning um, is several units which lean. And they're only about 16 inches high, and they're in clusters, and I meant for it to be exhibited so that it was rather spread out and you could actually walk amongst it and that that was what it was about. It was about you walking amongst it. And it couldn't be any higher really than your calf, nor any bigger really this way or that way than your foot, so size. I think it's sort of like when a spe person speaks quietly, you lean in mm -hmm. to listen, and sometimes we forget that smaller scale things are intriguing in their own way. What about you with scale, Kennedy? Because you, I saw in a TV interview where you talked about your works look so heavy, but some of them have very light components, and there's a little sleight of hand there. Yeah, well, I mean, I think that's a big part of my practice in general is that play on perception of you're not really, you really don't know what you're looking at or what if it's heavy or if it's light or if it's soft or hard or what the material is. So that's kind of like my, my, my magic in a way. I guess that's kind of what I do. But I think it, just with regard to scale, you know, I'm making consistently daily these like sculptural paintings for the wall and freestanding sculptures. And the way that I experience life is very much like zoom out, zoom in, zoom out, zoom in. And I'm, I'm kind of working through them as my cats in a way. I'm playing with, I'm, I'm, tr I'm understanding color and I'm understanding scale and form and how I can balance them in this smaller scale. But in my mind, I'm like, like Honey, I Shrunk the Kids is a huge, <laughs> you know, like a huge influence for me, just like thinking about what it's like to go in and go around and like be in that That's state. a first for an artist, so that, that that's well, the real. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think I refer to it a lot, actually, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Alice, just thinking of scale with you, because you really, you did a transformation and a few other artists that I've spoken with, like Frank Stella, you know, Frank started minimal, but then he became this exuberant maker of wild sculptures. You started low <laughs> and digging, and you, you narrated that it happened, but why? Why did you make that transition? Well, I think I just, um, it was interesting when Marin was talking about growing up, I also grew up the same way. My father was an architect, and I, he would come home every day, rush home, and he'd design this tiny little house. And I'd sit on, beside him, and uh, he'd give me some graph paper, and I'd try to draw what he was designing. And then he'd say, here, scale it, blah, 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 with a rule. So I grew up almost from the beginning with architecture with space, and it was like a duck being, you know, programmed, <laughs> and, uh, and, I, and it was glorious. It was, and then he built that house, and he gave me the little model to play with that I held in my hand. And so, and then I lived inside this place where it wasn't just the structure, all these things happened. So it was sort of like in my DNA to make architecture, but I did not want to make functional. I didn't want to design bathrooms or any of that stuff. I wanted to play. And I guess, you know, at some point, when you're underground, you're really going from light to dark. And we, a lot, a, a lot of the pieces I made, I'd say half, more than half, don't exist at all. So probably when I got the opportunity for once to make s some things that maybe would last a little while, <laughs> there was that. But I also think that it's the 
for me, it's the, the human um, engagement with the world, which I used to say I wanted to be as serious as trying to cross the street, which is pretty serious right now, yeah. <laughs> and, um, and, and with space and with the space all around you. And what is that confrontation like? It can be exuberant and extraordinary, and it can also be terrifying. And I want to be in that place. Uh, but I do make small things. Yeah. <laughs> I make tiny, <laughs> tiny little things yeah. for me. But I, you know, it's just, uh, but that's what gets out there is the big stuff. Yeah. So. Ian, I think what part of the scale conversation is suggested by those um, pottery shards that you showed. And last time we spoke uh, for an article was about Roberto Lugo, an, an artist in the Afrofuturist period room who makes fantastic ceramics. Um, and the idea of the part standing in for the whole, there's something about the unearthing idea that is mysterious and suggestive. In other words, we see a little part of something, but we don't know what that, can you talk about that, how, how sure. meaningful that can be? Sure. Um, you know, it's in, it was interesting to think about what Pierre's initial question, you know, trying to find the remnants of these dinosaur models, right? And what would have happened had we been able to, right? And I, I don't think we were the first to ask Central Park Conservancy whether they <laughs> they were sort of like, oh, this again. Um, but then, you know, and it's worth also mentioning the, the effort it took for these urban archaeologists at Columbia and Bar Graduate Center took them 10 years or more to get permission to do this excavation in Central Park, um, largely because the the prejudice from had had was like a hangover from the 19th century. The the New York press in the 1850s launched an all-out campaign to destroy Seneca Village and mm -hmm. and perpetuated the misinformation that this was a shanty town, that this was a slum, that this was a swamp, um, that it was polluted, that it was full of illness, and mm -hmm. and that perpetuated all the way until the 21st century um, when you know folks would tell these archaeologists no you're not going to find anything there it was a shanty town it was a slum and it's like <laughs> no, it wasn't and so it took you know that digging right to find these this incredible cache of material and we had a lot of conversations around the room in you know did we want to show some of those shards and we want to show some of that material evidence and and together we sort of decided that it would be better, in our view, to make it whole again, to not show the pieces, but to show, um, to show what it might be if it had never been shattered, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that to, and that that would, you know, a kind of more uh, archaeological show would be for someone else to do. And I think there's one in the works, which is exciting. Um, but that we wouldn't borrow any of those shards, and that we would find instead amalgams in the collection that would serve as speculative possibilities of what, of what those residents may have owned and what they may have passed down to their descendants and what their descendants might still yet treasure had they still had them. And, um, and that to us was so symbolic, I think, of the possibilities that, that Afrofuturism and that, that kind of speculative um, narrative might, might provide. So, so it's, I'm always interested in thinking about making things whole again, as much as I am interested in kind of digging around, um, <laughs> the depth, plunging the depths, plum, plumbing the depths, right? Yeah. Kennedy, you, you said you were honored to be here with Alice and Marin. And I'm thinking kind of generationally, and they've been working longer than you have. And how do you sort of think about their, what do you see in their careers in terms of how they've evolved and, and that longevity? Well, I feel like. You know, I wouldn't be sitting here today without the interrogations of work and discipline and w whatever bullshit you guys had to put up with <laughs> over the past years. Um, and I'm, you know, it's it's really it's a it's a privilege. Um, and it's it's interesting. I mean, it's just interesting to see how, how especially how all how your sculptures for for both of you have evolved over time, but have always been in such consistent. Um, conversation with, I mean, the sandbox, you know, it's like, we don't change. And I think one thing that I'm finding because like, and, and because of you guys, I get to be in this place in my career at a very young age, which is really special. And, and, I'm, and I'm trying to take 
confidence and comfort in the fact that like the things that I'm interested in, that I'm researching and that I'm turned on by are the same things that were there 10 years ago. So I'm, I'm, I'm having a, a bit of a reprieve because I see you doing that and also that I can, I can trust that that's gonna be the continuation of my study and of my um, interests and, and how that manifests physically in the space. I wanted to ask about Instagram because I know you're all on Instagram because I follow you all. I, was, I would, took a picture of uh, Klaus Oldenburg's um, trowel that was in Rockefeller Center, and which is also interesting for the, the unearthing topic because the trowel is just barely you know, stuck in, the, the tip of it is just suggestively just barely stuck in the earth. But Instagram is part of how public art is public. We share it. Is it, is that, that feedback loop, is that, is that something that you guys think about ever? And is it chain, a lot of artists use it very creatively. You know, I, I, I'm addicted to it, but I'm not addicted to me putting myself out on it. And I actually think it's sort of destructive in a way because you just get, now we're just so used to that one second, oh, 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 oh. And, uh, but one thing I would like to say, uh, because I think Christina's work is extraordinary in the park, and uh, for all of my large sculptures, et cetera, I am very wedded to nature and the landscape in my, and uh, I almost feel every time I make something, it has to have a lot of landscape and plants and all sorts of things around it. And I'd just like to say, um, you know, one, we had back in the 60s and the 70s the sense of the great American paradise, and we abused America terribly. I want, I want to put that out there. And I hope that projects like this will remind us that we have to have reverence for the land that we were given and try to take it back and preserve it. And, um, and, and not this endless sprawl. And um, because when, as I fly over, I am just, I am, feel such abject sadness of what we have done in the short period of time that I've been alive. I think this piece here is just exquisitely beautiful and talks about what New York City was. And I wish we had more of it. Okay, so that's my whatever here. <laughs> I think, we, well said. Um, I think we're gonna take a couple of questions. Does anybody have a question for these excellent panelists? There's somebody. Go ahead. Hi. My question is uh, for Marin, and uh, specifically, you said that people tolerated your sculpture, and, and I like to question that, whether they tolerated it or, or they loved it. Mm -hmm. When you put a piece of yourself in the public, and I wonder what you missed by not actually having an engagement with the chess players. Because you say you didn't tell them anything, and then they didn't want it to go. But in the middle could have been this conversation, and I wonder what you think about that loss. To be absolutely embarrassingly honest, this is the first time I ever thought of that. <laughs> <laughs> you're very, very sensitive, and you're very correct. I should have gone back to them, um, become friends with them. The first time I met him, the, the guy who spoke to me, he was quite hostile. Mm. And I didn't feel like I wanted to deal with that. You know, I just want to get this done. And um, in the times that I went back and forth, nobody had disturbed anything, nothing was awry, you know, or amiss, or, you know, in any way dismantled. And it was only after, you know, nearly a year that I heard this comment. Mm. And I was happy, because they owned it. I didn't own it. They owned it. And they didn't, he may have been the only one who knew it was me. Nobody else knew that. So it was kind of like, A gift. Does that answer your question? No. Oh. <laughs> but I, I just want to posit to you that if you're making public art. Yes. And, you're, and I make public art. Yes. I'm now commissioner of public design, so I'm public art in the city of New York. Yes. But the biggest gift is the people of New York. 
Yes. Yes, I can, I can. Yes. Okay. Cool. I absolutely agree with you, and I take your critique of my behavior seriously, and I totally agree with you. However, in the realm of things that happened in, in that situation, um, it didn't occur to me to sit there with the players and have conversations because nobody asked me to do that. Nobody from the studio museum asked me to do that. Um, the last conversation I had with the players was kind of hostile. I thought it would remain hostile. I thought, you know, like, this guy doesn't like me, so, you know, I'm not going to start anything. And um, You could probably finish it, though. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm a sweetie. <laughs> no, but, but the thing is, recently, I went to uh, Garvey Park, and the current installation there with the tall man looking at his cell phone, and I was in a bad mood that day, <laughs> and I happened to walk by, and there was a man sitting there complaining terribly about this piece of sculpture. <laughs> he was going on and on. And I sat and I listened to him, and I stayed there a couple of hours with he and his uh, companion. And uh, at the end of it, um, I ended up giving him the curator's uh, email. <laughs> and um, God. because I, I, what? No, Ian's looking forward to the yeah, no, email. No, uh, no. Not, she's not the only one. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, no, I love that story. I'm, I'm trying to say that I agree with you. And you can be sure the next time I put something public, I will be more like the Marin who had that two hour conversation and gave that cur curator's name to. Let's, let's, let's take one more question. So I apologize. Okay. Um, I have a question. This is for Kennedy. I noticed that one of your pieces was titled White Passing, and I was wondering if you could talk about that and whether you're thinking about like the ambiguity of like skin tones or its relationship to your own body or identity. Yeah, um, so White Passing was actually the name of the show at the Rubel Museum, and um, you know, a lot of my, I, I used bio, my, biograph, my, my biography and I used different parts of identity and politics and these conversations to kind of enter into the materials. Um, I'm black and white, my mom is black and my dad's white. And in this time, um, I, while I was doing the residency and creating this work, I also had embarked on a very long and extensive journey of writing a graphic novel um, that's dealing with uh, sexuality and race and um, it's basically using different forms of making and showing how that can be a catharsis and to move things through you. So a lot of my study at that time, a lot of my self-interrogations at that time was really looking at my skin color and, and how I'm relating to the world as a white passing biracial person. Um, and I think that, that that experience, there's not always words for things, at least for me. And I'm also coping with the idea that um, so much of my work is about the expression. And, and I was really hoping that, that there was some kind of transmutation from my research and from my experience and the things that I was trying to understand that would come through in the essence and the sensation that happened in the work. And I really do believe in that. I really do believe that as an artist, when you're thinking about something, as you're thinking about as you're doing it, there's like an actual cellular process of, of it coming into into space. 
Um, so that was kind of what I was looking at at that time. Thank you. Thank you. You guys, we have to wrap up, but amazing panel. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you. Onward. Because we got to put I'm going to yeah, do like yeah. a tour of it. Good morning. My name is Truth Murray Cole, and I am curatorial manager of Madison Square Park Conservancy. Thank you, Ted Luce, Ian Altavir, Marin Hassinger, Alice Acock, and Kennedy Yanko for your inspiring panel discussion. And now we are thrilled to begin our keynote conversation, Excavating History, Landscape, and Memory with artists Christina Iglesias and Lynn Cook, Senior Curator of Special Projects and Modern Art at the National Gallery of Art. Their full bios can be found in the program. The keynote will be followed by audience questions. I think we can move a little to the side. Uh, you want to move that? Yeah. Great. Thank you. Um, well, good morning. I want to begin by thanking um, Brooke and the Madison Square Park and Truth uh, for 
this invitation and for the help in setting it up. And Christina for um, an ongoing dialogue now over many years. Thank you. I also am so thank you to be here with all of you while we take the. <laughs> so, <laughs> hello. And um, yes, very, very happy to be today with you and to have the opportunity to have this conversation with you, Lynn. What we're going to do is um, show a couple of images from Landscape and Memory for people who may not have had the opportunity to get to the park to see it already. And then we're going to talk about um, four projects in uh, that over a span of almost 25 years in Christina's work that in different ways I think can be put into dialogue with landscape and memory and then in the last 20 minutes we'll focus on it and dive into some of the other issues that haven't come up in the, um, in the examination of these four pieces. So, so this is seeing it from a distance and what you, you can um, understand that there's something there because of the grass, the taller grasses that are growing and erupting into the smooth lawn. This is when you get closer to one of the five components and you get a better sense of what's there. And here you see into one of the, one of the elements where the water's running over um, the bronze uh, casting of different landscape elements. So um, to turn to precedence in different ways from, uh, for this work, I wanted to ask you first about Tres Aquas, which may be your best known public work. It's one of the largest and uh, it speaks to some of the issues that come up in this work. Although of course Tres Aquas is a um, a permanent piece in the city of Toledo, and this work is a temporary sighted piece. Mm. I'm going to let you do it. How do you move it? Like Just it? press it. Yeah. Um, yes, well, Tres Aguas is a piece that is conformed of three sites in Toledo. So the, this is the, the water tower that is so, Toledo is a city that is surrounded by a river that. Uh, so geologically is made out of many stratas and also the stratas of, of culture that uh, form the city through the centuries. Um, so I was thinking in three sites also referring to the moment the three cultures combined together, uh, the Muslim, Jewish and Christian cultures and that you can still find reminiscences of and, and constructions, uh, architecture and houses, and they share. It was a time where they share uh, many things, and one thing was water that uh, I, I took as a, also as a, as a material of communication and, um, and uh, I mean, communication and also um, uh, share, you know, I mean, something that they share together. Um, the tower is by the river, and uh, you have to to take the stairs up to see the river, to see the city, and then you confront yourself. I mean, I, I emptied the whole tower and converted it into um, a sort of fountain. I mean, an interior fountain. I mean, it is about the bottom of the river. And it is an illusion. I create places, places to be and to think. And uh, actually, uh, I create illusions and, uh, and fictions. So this uh, piece is, is, the, is by the river. And then you have to, of course, the walk between one and the others um, is part of the piece. It's part of the, of the thinking and, and the experience. Uh, I do think a lot in all, in all my pieces about perception and the, and, and the viewer, how, how they will perceive the piece, how they, how they will encounter it, and how they will relate it to urban and 
natural landscape and in nature landscape. And um, so in this case, one feels, of course, the use of water implies also the use of time, the creation of sequences, and uh, the sound of it. So all this is implicit in the three sides and uh, in also the memory, the memory that you have of not only the other piece, or the, let's say the other side that where you have been, but also the in-betweens, what you find between one and the other, those layers I was talking about of history and, uh, and, uh, and also to get lost between one of them that prepare you to the next one. Mm -hmm. And so there is some, um, we did a lot of excavation. This is the plaza of the, uh, the uh, town hall, but also the cathedral that was before a mosque and the obispate. So it's like a triangle of power. And uh, uh, the excavation, I mean, brought a lot of issues because every centimeter in Toledo is full of history. And uh, so the archaeologists were part of the, of, of the installation. I mean, it took a long time to do the, this piece. We finished in 2014 by the commemoration of El Greco, but, um, but we started like five years before with Art Angel uh, from London there. So this is like a river that appears and disappears. The water runs in the center and then towards the real river that you can see somehow through the streets. And then it comes back, the water, backwards, and fills it to the, to the top and, uh, and stays still being, becoming a mirror of, of all these magnificent buildings and the people. And, uh, and then it goes back again and, uh, and it has a cycle. So, uh, it is a, a lot about uh, the citizens that, that live there. I mean, the relation, how they relate to the peace, but also about the interruption of that traffic and tourism that also is those citizens that uh, are everywhere. And uh, normally they go with a, with a plan of uh, timing, and so a piece like this it has also this idea of interrupting and make things slower. It is a very slow sequence, that one. And um, it is, I mean, the water uh, unveils and veils that abstract form in, in this case is, case is in stainless steel and uh, casted stainless steel of uh, elements that come from nature sometimes, but also they are um, invented, let's say, in the studio with uh, just with mud and with uh, um, all the materials and wax at the end. And so there is a composition that tries to work on that level of uh, abstraction with details that make you remember. And, and then your mind reconstructs the whole. Um, this one is the third one that is in the convent of Santa Clara, that is the upper part of the city. So we are going from the bottom by the river to the upper part of the city, that is where the, the, the vegetable gardens were in the convents, etc. So this is a very quiet room that you can enter from the street and, uh, and is super silent. Uh, but uh, again, you confront yourself to uh, memory of what you have seen and the memory also of the convent and, and the, the experience you are having of um, walking along the city. And, uh, and I believe that uh, your brain, as I was saying, reconstructs the whole uh, with the memory you had, with, with what you are looking, but you end it with a new memory in your in your mind. And this is, of course, part of the intention of the whole piece. Right. So the next one is very different. Toledo, as many people know, is a World Heritage Site. It has a huge audience in addition to the people who live there. So many people would um, 
encounter this work in the plaza or maybe if they had a good map, uh, one of the, or both of the other two components without necessarily having it as a destination. Mm -hmm. but, but it would be part of their experience of visiting. The next one um, is, an in, in many ways, an invisible sculpture. It's in um, a marine sanctuary and um, you can't see it uh, unless you, you wouldn't see it unless you had a map which gives you an indication of where uh, 17 meters below the surface of the water it is. And you c can see it if you snorkel, but really the ideal way is, is to dive and uh, be amongst the fish and the crustaceans and the other components. Can you say something about this? I think it's the yes. right. How you came to do it, because it would seem to be really diametrically opposed in, in its many concerns from yes. Trois Aquas. Yes. Well, it is, but actually, in also in other pieces, but um, the idea of the remote uh, and uh, not only physically, but also this idea that um, you can create a place somewhere which is not ac so accessible and you have to believe it exists. Um, I was very intrigued by that and uh, I was asked, actually, because they, uh, so this is a collaborative piece that I did with uh, uh, marine biologists and uh, um, ecologists that were uh, constructing and uh, well, working on a program of construction of, uh, um, of uh, marine refuge uh, so that people wouldn't fish in certain places and the, and the, the, the fishes would and, and life will grow uh, to be able then, of course, to go to other, uh, to swim away. But, um, so this is the island of Espiritu Santo that was, um, by this foundation, it was preserved by buying little uh, private uh, sites and give them back to the estate so it became public. So they asked me to do something, so a monument, but, <laughs> Uh, it is more an anti monument or, a, or let's say it is a, a, a place uh, for life to grow. It is actually also a lab because the idea with the marine biologists was to create something close to the, to the manglars so that uh, they could study also how, and, and they helped me to place it in, the ra well, in a place where, and with materials that is a very special concrete with neutron pH so that life will adapt, I mean, attach to it. And um, so um, I constructed uh, two sites that are uh, not, not too apart from each other, but you have to, I mean, when you dive, as you were saying, to dive is, is to, be, to be in it. And, uh, and, and you can enter. There are two sides of stanzas of rooms. And uh, uh, I said it's a lab because we have also, uh, uh, well, we don't have photos of everything, but um, it was uh, open in 2010. And uh, so in 2013 was already, well, even on the, on the 10th, immediately was, uh, invaded by life and and different uh, f uh, um, flora and fauna, but also in organisms, um, have been growing through these years. And uh, we have been taking uh, films and photos of of, of it. Uh, so the idea was to create an architecture that will of course provoke these, allow these in the right place with the, with the corals that clean but make the corals grow uh, stronger. And at the end, well, and it has a text that conforms the, the walls. It's a text that from a book that is called his nat uh, history, not a Natural and Moral History of uh, of the of the Indies, so it's of the uh, Americas, and 
and it talks about the Atlantida as a, as a poetical and philosophical side. It talks about uh, things that they already have uh, experienced, but also about dreams or, or ideas of what it could be. So this conforms uh, the uh, an excerpt of the text conforms the, all the, the walls, the 20 walls, but um, of course that uh, it was clear that it was going to disappear uh, with nature living in it and uh, and um, and as I said, that's why it's also a lab because we study, they study it and I, when I can, I also dive there with them these years. And this text, which is written in the 16th century, yes. I think, um, is really talking about the arrival of colonizers and That's right. the um, effects of colonization and uh, compares this to um, Plato's myth of Atlantis, this mm -hmm. empire which finally um, destroys and sinks back into the ocean. Mm -hmm. So there's... Um, an, an, I'll come back to this later when we're looking at uh, landscape and memory, but there's a very clear mm. uh, an reference in this piece to the um, impact of colonization and the ecological and, and cultural and social mm. Um, mm. depredations mm. that followed mm. that. And, and if, as you say, it's very subtle, and eventually it too will disappear because the, the crustaceans and, and other... Um, elements growing mm. on there will, will block the gaps in the text and it will become an encrusted set of surfaces. Yes, well there are some that live there so I don't know if maybe they will keep some <laughs> holes in it and, and certainly as I said it's an architecture that uh, it will become a garden but, um, but it has an, that uh, um, form, order, uh, just to stand, you know, it was meant to to stand by itself, so that we didn't needed to we didn't need to do holes or anything. It's on the sun. So it's environmentally environmentally friendly, friendly and, yeah. and and it's um, it's not about ruins. It's it's about a future which will be a Just post Anthropocene mm. future mm. because mm. It could go on um, That's right. infinitely. Mm. And so the next one is, oh well, is oh, again a bit more of that. Is another is an urban project, but this one is in Antwerp, and you took about ten years to do this, and it's a, a confluence of streets in front of the Musée des Beaux Arts, the mm -hmm. main museum, um, and the opportunity came when the. Um, traffic flow was being redesigned by mm. um, an architectural team of Roberts and Dan. And Dan yeah. correct? Yes. Can That's correct, yeah. And how does this one work? Um, and and mm. again, it's one in which there's a central caesura or cut, mm -hmm. and the water cycles from uh, a full when it's completely still and mirrors the surroundings to a complete um, evaporation, empty, yeah. empty, emptying Emptiness. out, and uh, to the point where you could, well, little children tend to walk over it and mm. in it um, as, as a, a very shallow pond. Yes, yes, it is as you will see, or you can see a very shallow pond. Um, the idea was, I mean, I worked uh, at that time, was the first big uh, the first public piece I did with water. It started in, it was accepted by the city of Antwerp in 97, but it took uh, nearly 10 years to, to be realized for different reasons of administration, etc. But the, the, the square was done by the architects Robert and Dan, and, uh, and, uh, and the site was prepared all that time with flowers to wait for the piece to, to be. But we constructed the underground um, uh, uh, water containers, etc. And uh, so the piece works, as you said, with time. I mean, it's in front of the of the museum, of the stairs of the museum. And I thought then that uh, in the time that a person would take to enter the museum, to to look at the 
paintings and, and sculpture and go out and and uh, and and how long that would be that actually many times is very short time and um, uh, so the piece takes the sequence takes one hour so it's uh, it's as you were describing two moments of stillness that is when it's totally full and when it's uh, it uh, it's empty and uh, and the moment of getting f full and, and 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 draining and uh, so the idea is that it is is about depth about the how uh, the water disappears uh, or, or appears through this cut this editor that is 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 really like a uh, beginning of an abyss and uh, it's about de depth I uh, they were at the beginning when I talked to the city they were thinking I was going to do a fountain with vertical jets and uh, and they wanted me to to work with this special company in Hollywood and uh, and I had to defend that you know that depth was was could be also something very Astonishing, and uh, and that would uh, move you, and uh, not that I didn't need to do that, uh, and actually I didn't wanted to do that. I mean, I was not interested in in doing a, 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 a such a fountain, but a piece with water that it is a fountain too, and I call it deep fountain because of that, uh, and it takes, as I said, one hour. So again, is a piece that uh, that. Uh, sorry, that that was. I don't know if this is going back. Yeah. Uh, so it's a piece that that uh, again uh, interrupts the traffic. Or when I say traffic, is not the cars. I mean, it's the movement of the people. Is the how people move in the city and make them look in a different way. Also, it's a, a meeting place, a place to wait, to wait, to enter in the museum, to enter, or maybe to. To wait for others to, 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 to just to gather or to meet strangers, but uh, it's a place where you can sit and, and look. I've, I'm very interested with the pieces in, uh, as I was saying, of course, in perception and how to play with that, how to play with with the tricks or of, of even slowness, uh, how how something starts to disappear and and, and you start seeing more than what you were seeing before, before you were seeing the reflection, or you were seeing, or, or, or at moments you think nothing is happening, and, uh, and well, you have to. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm looking at, we're being waved yes, so by, let's by red flags, but I'm not fast. sure how many yeah. minutes that means. One minute to wrap the whole thing up? <laughs> For questions, okay. Um, yeah. So we have this one. The uh, then if we've got one minute, let's go faster. Yes. And <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Can, can we go through to the Madison? Yeah, well, Club? this is Norway. As uh, Laura Leaves is like, it's the first um, a public piece I did, and it's made in casted aluminum of laurel leaves that is, is very, very north in Norway, in the Lofoten Islands. and. Uh, and it is a standpoint to look at the sea, but also like the doors to a cave in, the, in, in that fjord, in that mountain. Okay, then let's go to, back to landscape and memory. One of the questions I wanted to ask you, you talked, and you do very often in interviews, about remembering and imagining, like looking back, looking forward. And one of the things that strikes me about landscape and memory is the suggestion of looking back in these under, um, underground waterways that in Manhattan, as in um, so many cities around the world, have been covered over and suppressed. Mm. And what we seem to be seeing here is an eruption or a fissure in the land, and this water is returning and um, bubbling up. And uh, in the research materials that you consulted, some of which you sent me, there was an article in the New York Times from 1892, which is titled, Underground Streams as Breeders of Contagion. And it talks about, in the headline too, sources of great danger. And I don't want to get too much into 
the f medical issues that this article is talking about, but to talk about it more in terms of the return of water that's been um, artificially, that we've constrained. constrained. And, and of course, we're seeing the return of water, not just um, um, from springs and uh, clean water, but but we know the sea levels are rising. We know, we've all seen maps of what mm. um, in the future Man Manhattan might look like. And so I, I wanted to think about this in relation to the reference to Atlantis mm -hmm. in the Estancia Sumerhidas and the idea that uh, T.J. Demas writes about when he's talking about that piece that we're living, quote, in a time of unstoppable collapse, not unlike Atlantis. And I wanted to say to you, isn't there a very dark side to this piece? It isn't, mm -hmm. um, so it may be about hope and imagining, but it's imagining uh, a future that's anything but um, uh, affirmative. And that part of your interest, long interest in science fiction also speaks to, to a future in which the world mm -hmm. is very changed. Yes, but um, uh, of course, I think uh, darkness, I mean, l is in life. I mean, there is light and there is darkness. And, uh, and it is more an alarm to say we have to take care of what we've got. And uh, uh, of course, there are ways. Now we all, I mean, many people, and that's very good news, are talking and concerned about it. But I, with this piece, I wanted to talk about, yeah, about the memory of what it was there, of this river that uh, ran across that, the park and how the, those, uh, let's say, the five openings show a dark uh, a mix of rocks and roots and organisms that, that are represented but will also appear and, uh, and the water runs. The continuity of it, I mean, is, is, uh, is shown by the, uh, that um, sense of humidity I wanted to give by the, this grass, that special grass that grows higher, but also these mirrors that uh, in our imagination are like a reflection of the continuity of, uh, of, uh, that happens in our mind no? between them. And uh, I think, uh, yes, it, it talks about all that that is under our feet, that is connected, that is, as we know, that, that, that all the roots and the, and, and the, and the fungi and, the, and, um, and the dirt and the cables that, that have been uh, constructed under the cities, etc., communicate us, but also uh, we have to, to be concerned of, uh, how we construct, and this is something, and that parks are so, and also talks about the community uh, of the park that uses the park so much, so that I thought that to bring this memory back to, we, we reconstruct memory, we construct also a landscape, so uh, it's a reflection on that. Right, we have another signal. Questions? Do I have to go? This is the last one? So no. Uh, are there any questions? It's hard to see. There's one over here. I was curious about your, um, the installation. Can you in speak up? Again? Oh, sorry. I was curious about the installation in Antwerp. Uh -huh. um, how that came into existence was that you approaching the city, or um, how did how did that become realized, or who initiated mm -hmm. that conversation? Mm. Well, um, actually, it was the the city in combination, but in, in mainly the architects that were constructing the reconstru. I mean, reorganizing that that square and the museum. So they. They ask me to do. I mean, they ask the city and the museum if I could do, could collaborate, and so they decided so, and they offered me this to do this work, uh, to do a work that could um, somehow well, 
uh, with Paul and Hilde, I had the, the architects, I had a relation, we had done already a collaboration. I have collaborated with many architects uh, in different projects in the world and uh, uh, we had already talked about issues and they knew that I was interested in doing things with water in 97 and uh, that I did some models and in a small well, etc. I was thinking on sequences to create, uh, to use water as a material uh, and in that time that I could make visible. And uh, so they asked me and I reacted to it and proposed the project. Thank you, Christina Iglesias and Len Cook for your searching dialogue on the implications of unearthing buried histories in public art. We are now excited to welcome presenters Alan Michelson, Mark Wigley, and Deborah Landau. Artist Alan Michelson will present first, followed by Mark Wigley, Professor of Architecture and Dean Emeritus at Columbia University. Poet Deborah Landau, Professor and Director of NYU's Creative Writing Program, will conclude with a reading of three of her poems. Their full bios can be found in the program. I'm a New York-based artist. I'm also a Mohawk member of Six Nations of the Grand River, the six being the Mohawk, Oneida, Onondaga, Cayuga, Seneca, and Tuscarora nations of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, also known as the Iroquois, whose original homelands to the north comprise about 80% of present New York State. Our current territory, as you can see, um, consists of several small scattered reserves upstate and in Canada, Wisconsin, and Oklahoma. I came here decades ago as an undergraduate and returned in 1989 for a project with the Public Art Fund. It was the start of my practice of researching the history of a site, in this case that of a lost lake in lower Manhattan, and distilling those findings into work grounded in local context. It was very much an outsider practice at the time, but one that has since gone mainstream. In my case, it evolved from the need to trace history where there was none save for history conceived from the settler colonial perspective, based more on fantasies than reality, fantasies of white superiority and entitlement, fantasies of native savagery and nobili or nobility. History imagined from this perspective ignores evidence to the contrary, protecting but impoverishing itself in the process. Such narrowness of vision, such self-censorship and denial betrays a fear at the heart of the American project of difference that has long been expressed as racism, violence, and exclusion. At the same time, the surfacing of invisible histories by artists, scholars, and activists has gained traction, sparking a fear of education. History has become a battleground in this nation, rendering the ground itself unstable and contested. A stroll through a park can also be an unwitting stroll through invisible histories, such as the abandoned potter's field beneath Madison Square. In 1993, I did this work, Permanent Title, in which I took rubbings on muslin of structures built over former burial grounds in Manhattan. The muslin was then sewn into waxed cloth sacks, like the ones formerly used to shroud the dead. The detail on the right shows my rubbing of the Admiral Farragut monument in the park. This seismic instability is also evidenced in recent, the recent conflict over monuments and in the indigenous land back movement. We call the continent Turtle Island and are organized into clans named for our animal kin. In the case of the Mohawk, wolf, bear, and turtle. 
and we call our prime vegetables corn, squash, and beans, the three sisters. Sadly, our lot as colonized indigenous people has also been shared by our non-human relations. So our displacement and genocide were accompanied by their displacement and echocide. Some of you may have seen Midden, the video installation I made for Greater New York uh, exhibition at PS1 this year. It consists of panoramic video of local shorelines shot from a boat, projected onto three tons of oyster shells generously lent to us by the Billion Oyster Project which collects them from area restaurants and recycles them into the harbor as oyster reefs. The shells were piled on the floor of the duplex gallery in the form of a long banked mound, which allowed it to be viewed from three different levels. From the main floor looking down, from the basement and the sub-basement. The closer you got to the shells, the more abstract became the video, and more the shells and their materiality took over. I've got a short clip here. Do I have to hit it again or something? Here we go. The soundtrack is a recording of the Ganatwe, or stick dance songs, sung by Akwesasne Mohawk singers. It is also known as the Delaware or Lenape skin dance because the Lenape brought it to us for safekeeping in a time of cultural crisis. As a Mohawk, it connects me both to my ancestral homeland and to Lenape Hoking. These are the indigenous songs of this land and its rhythms are its heartbeat. The video was shot from a boat in Newtown Creek and in the Gowanus in Brooklyn both once rich oyster grounds. I first heard of shell middens in the 1980s when I was researching Collect Pond, the former large spring-fed Kettle Lake in Lower Manhattan left by a retreating glacier. Br browsing through the Columbia Historical Portrait of New York, I was arrested by this image, a 1798 watercolor by Archibald Robertson of a Manhattan pond I couldn't place and steep, equally unfamiliar hill. As I delved deeper, I learned of another large hill on the west side of the pond, present-day Tribeca, a shell midden left by the Lenape, the Dutch colonists named Kalkhoek, or Shell Point. You can see um, uh, it, it named in, in the map on the left. Um, it may have been pictured on the far shore of the pond behind a building that might have been one of the tanneries, distilleries, or slaughterhouses which ruined the pond with their waste. They turned the 48-acre, 60-foot deep pond, a source of fresh water for the Lenape and the main source of fresh water for the New Amsterdam and New York, for 200 years into a stinking open sewer. The city drained it by widening its stream to the Hudson into a fetid canal that was eventually covered over to become Canal Street and filled it by leveling the hill in the midden. Within barely 200 years of colonization, a life-sustaining lake that had existed for 15,000 years was poisoned, buried, and erased, its gravestone the original tombs, prison, and execution ground built on its site. At the time, I had a residency at Sailor Snug Harbor on Staten Island and started casting the shores of the live pond there, which became this work, Earth's Eye. Each of the 40 concrete blocks contained a different bas-relief casting related to the social and natural history of the site, and one of them was of a mound of oyster shells. The blocks were arranged in the shape of the pond shoreline on its former site, a drab pocket park between Center and Lafayette surrounded by court buildings and the, and the latest iteration of the tomb's prison. The missing midden, Kalkok, stayed with me all these years. When I was invited to show at PS1, I saw an opportunity to commemorate the middens of Lenape Hoking and to honor the indigenous cultural and environmental practices they represented. My idea was to project panoramic video of former oyster grounds onto a bed of oyster shells and to reach out to the Billion Oyster Project for a loan of shells from one of their middens on Governor's Island, which they generously agreed to supply. Their ambitious project is to place a billion oyster shells in the harbor and reefs that become fish habitat in order to clean the water. Oysters are our keystone species. One oyster, through its consumption of polluting compounds, can clean up to 50 gallons of water a day. My research unearthed a very large midden near the Hudson in Dobbs Ferry discovered in the 80s during construction at the time the largest undisturbed midden site in the Northeast. 
Can we bulldoze over 4,000 years of history, inquired the flyer put out by the Historical Society, and unfortunately the answer was yes, save for a tiny portion of the midden, which more recent carbon dating placed at 6950 BCE. Judging from the multitude of these coastal middens, it is safe to say not only that indigenous people liked oysters, but that they were an abundant indigenous food source for millennia until the people were displaced from their coastal homelands and fisheries, severe economic and cultural losses. 9,000 years is the very definition of sustainable practice, and local oysters fed not only the Lenape, but generations of New Yorkers until the demise of the oyster grounds 100 years ago. As you may know, wampum are purple and white beads fashioned from shells. In addition to their beauty and flexibility, wampum belts are vehicles of diplomacy that encode agreements within their form and design. The top belt is a reproduction of the two-row wampum, representing a 1613 agreement between the Haudenosaunee and the Dutch who were moving into our land. The two pur purple rows symbolize the parallel courses of two vessels on the same river a Haudenosaunee canoe and a European sailing ship, and calls, for, um, and calls for each party to stay in its own boat and not try to steer the others, to coexist as equals in respectful, peaceful relation. I've referred to the two-row wampum before in my work, both for its formal and symbolic qualities, and its meaning still, <coughs> excuse me, still resonates. The role of art in the redescription of history is vital. Superimposing video onto oyster shells can't reverse the impositions of 400 years of colonization, but it can, it can honor and celebrate the beauty, power, and resilience of indigenous people and of our non-human kin, and the important work of allies like the Billion Oyster Project and PS1. I'd like to thank them and the Virilis Center at the New School, with whom I partnered on the Indigenous New York Project in 2016 and 17, and all of the institutions who are not afraid of change or history. Thank you. Uh, so some quick words um, about, about the work of um, Christina Iglesias and, and coming being a member of the Architects Union um, and Iglesias is good, so we, I will claim that uh, she's an architect, always an architect. Um, and this might require you to think architecture differently. And if architecture, like all of the arts, is a way to make you hesitate and think, this is what makes the work architectural, that it, Christina is making you think architecture differently. Maybe the clue would be in this title, Secreting Architecture. So yes, the secrets of architecture, uncovering the secrets. But also I want you to consider the possibility that architecture is a secretion, that it's coming out of you. And you might think, well, that's a bit weird. For example, the, the room that you're in, you are inhabiting a secretion of the, of the human species. Might seem uncomfortable, unpleasant. Uh, maybe what you don't want your architects to, to offer you. But it, isn't it strange that we also want architecture to be full of straight lines and right angles and smooth surfaces? These are exactly the things you cannot find in nature. So architecture has been, in, for many cultures, uh, a kind of representation of human exceptionalism. Because we can make this, we are not like nature. We, so simultaneously, we want architecture to be us, very much us, but not the biological us, not, not the secretions. Not, so we're asking something very strange. Or we want to invent a kind of a human, a kind of non-human human, and therefore maybe the history of architecture is a kind of a history of defending a kind of weird idea uh, of what constitutes the human. And very much the work of Iglesias is, is a call to, to back, back to uh, or refusal of this kind of uh, distinction. And I tried to show you with this uh, a sketch of the work which I completely love, so I try to explain why I love it. Firstly, because it looks like a surgical operation, right? There has been a, a kind of incision, a kind of geometric cut, and immediately below there's something kind of fleshy, you can sense al already kind of li liquidy. Also, it seems a bit uh, dangerous what's inside, this stuff, right? So something clean cut, human, abstract, geometric, uh, through the grass, which has itself been cut, so it is itself a, a kind of miniature architecture, 
a horizontal surface, a horizontal green surface has been cut, a human surface cut by a human, revealing something, ah, I don't know if I necessarily want to see this, and this thing that I see is immediately there below the surface, not deep buried repressed, or to say it's something else, if it is repressed, it's repressed just there. Uh, but what interests me, just uh, to re remind you of this drawing, is I think what's so curious of Iglesias' work is that there is a, an astonishing intimacy between this strange, uncanny, liquidy, bubbly, smelly kind of world uh, and the clean-cut surface. They are like Im almost impossible to link. You see already the marking of the mirror that will enable you to imagine that this thing keeps going, that, that, that this green surface and this hidden thing, they are together. They are not so easily... Uh, uh, separated. Th this is also something prime primeval, no? So yes, it's something about the history of the site, but it's also about a kind of a deep history, even primeval, some kind of confusions of tendrils and stones, uh, something from before the human, before everything, something the beginning, not just the history, but perhaps the beginning of everything, or perhaps, I think as Lynn was suggesting, also possibly the end uh, of everything. Maybe we don't want to just cut through the surface and immediately face our own birth, also a very liquidy, messy, smelly, bubbly uh, experience, uh, uh, many are afraid of. I'm not saying this is a kind of caesarean section, but it's possible, right? Um, uh, nor do we want to face uh, death, but even more remarkably, we probably do not want to face uh, 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 life. Uh, I think, for example, of your own body, if, if I make a similar cut in my body, uh, it smells, it gurgles, it bubbles, uh, it's offensive, it's illegal, I would be not allowed to do this, right? Uh, it's, also what, it's also what keeps me alive, right? So I am, I'm, I'm only, it's only possible for me to be, to live, because of a whole series of processes of liquidities of chemical reactions that are actually offensive to me. So what makes me a, a possible to live is also uh, offensive. And in, when I say me, what do I mean, right? There's some sort of shape, a kind of architecture, right? Uh, it looks like there's an entrance and an exit, a mouth and an anus. Between them, there is considerable meters of tubes, intestines, and the real entrance to the body is the small intestine, right? Because that's where I absorb all of the outside world. Actually, the intestine, the system is the outside world passing through me. I'm kind of wrapped around the outside. So what makes me a human is kind of an accretion around a tube, right? So the last thing I want to know about is that, <laughs> right? Uh, and, and we devote an enormous part of our, of our kind of cultural life to hiding any evidence of the fact that we are alive. So if we ask, and, and, and buildings, by the way, are the same, even this not terribly exciting building has actually an enormously, it's also living and breathing and, ex, and excreting, and it's connected to every other building, right? So the thing that makes it difficult for us to recognize what we are and therefore, of course, our responsibility to all other species, which, which we are anyway primarily bacteria, right? So responsibility even to the species that make us is also true of architecture, right? And we also spend a lot of time hiding the fact that uh, uh, buildings are like this. I, I'm seeing th the work in these terms, right? So again, a cut, sort of a geometric cut in a plaza, which reveals this kind of confusion of life and death. It's also fossilized, so it's literally already dead, or it is a, a life that began and then stopped. Li life and death, and the water comes in and goes out. Also messy. You can Im almost imagine a smell, even if it's clean, right? It's, it's kind of uh, life is there, but it's outside the architecture in the plaza, but it's also uh, inside, right? And it's confusing, a confusion of, the, of this liquidy mess is confused with this architecture that is supposed to stand against us. This is supposed to be something like nature, right, and the building something like culture, but in this work, nature and culture, they are very much uh, uh, confused. You see it again in London. Uh, again, a kind of secret world is exposed. And don't you notice that it's more or less the same world that's exposed in London, in Toledo, in New York? So it is, it's as if uh, Christina Iglesias is not only a public artist, but is the artist of the biggest work ever in the history of art, which is the size of the planet, because she surgically drills a hole almost everywhere and finds this just below the surface. But what I'm trying to say to you is not just below the surface, kind of in the surface. Again, the kind of mirroring that is forcing you to see a kind of r relationship between the abstract smooth lines and what is actually equally abstract, fictional, as Christina would put it, uh, uh, world within, 
and you see it everywhere. So I'm just inviting you to consider the possibility that what you see when you see this interior is that you are seeing the interior of the stone and of the geometry. Right? What makes this a powerful image is not that there is a frame through which you see this interesting world, but you have a little bit the feeling that these two are, are impossible to, to separate. Even when the th frame is very, very thick, right? And you think you can say, okay, there is the art, there is the gallery, and so on. There is all, still the same kind of mirroring, the same kind of uh, uh, confusion. Even when it kind of bubbles up in the middle of a plaza, it seems to be framed off. There is just a feeling like that building and that interior, they are somehow linked there, dependent on each other. And that it, as it were, passes through. Again, echoes that you will see in, in, in New York. And it's again and again and again. In other words, this is work that it's, it's kind of uh, has a rhythm. If each, each of the pieces has a rhythm in and out, the work itself has a rhythm by virtue of the way it keeps appearing in different places and different places. Again, again, the same call to consider the possibility that inside everything uh, uh, lies this work, even when, as it were, kind of like in Houston, sort of uh, uh, bubbles up. So what's my point? Okay, this, this, this was the point. Right? So, so just if it's possible you, for you to agree with me that there is a world inside of us which is actually us, the real us, that defies the distinctions between inside and outside or is a kind of confusion, uh, it, and, and it, we, in as much as we are who we are, are produced by this kind of ke endless chemical reactions that involve uh, thousands of species, many of which are millions of years old, and it's possible to see our buildings the same, as part of us, even part of our bodies. By the way, we don't survive without architecture. Therefore, as, from a species point of view, buildings are part of our organic kind of uh, structure. Then it's possible to look again at the work and notice again that, for example, it's not just that there is an int intimacy between the primeval kind of soup, the kind of digestive system that's exposed. There's not just a relationship between that and the frame of the work and the buildings that align the frame, but even you could read it in reverse that this primeval pool is kind of producing this line in the middle, that straight lines, the very things that, nature, that are strange to nature, are produced within this kind of half nature. So these are, in a way, machines for producing line. Again and again, you'll notice that inside, inside the work is the production of a line. You see, as it were, the birth of geometry right, inside the field. And again, I could show you countless images, but just a few. So again, a kind of strange intimacy between the organic soup and the seemingly clear-cut architectural frame, but then the reappearance of the beginnings of such lines in the middle of the work. And again, back to Toledo, you see it kind of like the birth of the line. And just to finish with the two most clear examples of this, so, so again, the thought that actually uh, perhaps in Iglesias' work, there is kind of three kinds, digging down, a kind of building up and hovering over, and the building up and hovering over look like architecture, right? And the one that seems least architectural, almost anti-architectural, is the kind of digging. But you see in this work, it's a kind of reverse engineering. The building is coming up out of the soup. It's not that there is in the building a soup, but the building is kind of part of it. It's very, very clearly engineered, even sort of visually engineered, so that the architecture is a kind of emergent coming up out of, out of the water. So giving birth not just to lines. You see it, of course, in the brilliance of San Sebastian. We look down into the abstract geometry, down and down we go to this new world, which turns out to be the old world, turns out to be the world from which is actually producing the building, and the visitor is literally suspended between this so-called nature and this so-called building, both of which are human artifacts, both of which make these kind of commentaries. Right? And then if you go to the, the work that's coming up, it's the same thing. Now we are kind of looking sideways instead of down, but we look through a kind of abstract geometry to a sort of vegetation world. And what's amazing about the work, of course, is that it's just the same. There's no dissonance between the smoothness and the shininess and the vegetation. This is the power of the work. So that, of course, architecture is made of this stuff. This is just the same as this building, just doesn't have that last very, very thin layer. Of course it becomes architecture, can make buildings, because architecture was always made of that stuff. Yes, it can creep and crawl and all of that stuff, but most importantly it's always there, sort of lurking, bubbling and so on. And it's in that image uh, that I totally love. Thanks. <laughs> that was just to say that Christina Iglesias is an architect which means architecture is not what you thought it was.
Hi. I've been asked to read three poems. Now I want to say I've been asked to secrete three <laughs> poems um, to close out the symposium. And I think that poets are always preoccupied with what's under the surface, with what's sublimated or subterranean and excavating that material. So that's the bridge I'm going to make. And I'm going to start with a poem that I wrote years ago when I first noticed that people were starting to walk down the street looking into their phones and the layer of tech or screens we put uh, in between ourselves and, and everything. You've got to start somewhere. I had the idea of sitting still while others rushed by. I had the thought of a shop that still sells records, a letter in the mailbox, the way that book felt in my hands. I was always elsewhere. How is it to have a body today, to walk in the city, to run? I wanted to eat an apple so precisely the tree would make another exactly like it then lie down uninterrupted in the gadgetless grass. I kept texting the precipice, which kept not answering, my phone auto-making everything incorrect. I had the idea, put down the phone. Earth, leaves, storm, water, vine, the gorgeous art of breathing. I had the idea the hope of friending you without electricity, of what could be made among the lamp posts with only our voices and hands. And um, the next and last two poems I'll read are both from a forthcoming book of mine called Skeletons, um, which is, uh, I guess, literally what's uh, it's about what's underneath our flesh, our bones, and, um, and death, which is always waiting, coursing under everything. And it's a pandemic book. Um, and the poems are acrostics. They have skeleton down the, down the left side margin. And this was at the New York Review last month. Uh, skeleton. It was written uh, at the beginning of the pandemic. Streaming Netflix is the opposite of action, a nap kept low burning on the margins, as if not existing, I don't exist, as if slipped from the yoke of life, simple, lazy, the hours pass until the act of life, its people and tethers, ether wisp into a faint of memory, a trace. The small art and craft of talk, how did we manage it? Something stayed the same like our nostalgia for Obama, like insomnia. Far away places became more and more like this place. Nights were felt as a stream of departures in the hive. And um, the New Yorker put two of these skeletons together for like a double acrostic, and this is the last poem I'll read. Skeletons. So, Whatever's the opposite of a Buddhist, that's what I am. Kind-hearted, yes, but knee-deep in existential gloom. Except when the fog smokes the bridges like this, like instead of being afraid, we might juice ourselves up, eh? Like might get kissed again. Dwelling in bones, I go straight through life, a sublime abundance, cherries, dog's breath, the sun, then Ouch, and all of us snuffed out. Dear one, what's waiting for us tonight? Nostalgia, the homes of childhood, oblivion, how we hate to go. Sundays I spend feeling sorry for myself. I've got a knack for it. I'm morbid, make the worst of any season, exclamation point. Yet levity's a liquor of sorts lowers us through life toward the terminus, soon extinguished. Darling, the comfort is slight. Tucked in bed, we search each other for some alternative. Oh, let's marvel at the world, the stroke 
and colors of it now while breathing. Thanks so much. This has been such an extraordinary morning and how incredible to finish with language. So thank you, Deborah. Um, thank you, Christina and Lynn Cook for your uh, powerful dialogue on the implications of unearthing buried histories in, in public art. And to all of our panelists, Ted Luce, Alice Acock, Ian Altavir, Marin Hassinger, Kennedy Anko, we're so grateful um, to you all for being here and for participating in such an important way this morning. Um, and thank you, Mark Wigley and Alan um, Michelson, for bringing your work and stories to this program. And thank you, everyone, for coming out um, this morning in person to our annual symposium. See you soon. Thank you.